The sun's coming up. Greetings, everyone. We're here live with Professor Burke Files and Daria Norikova. Uh, we're also going to have Lax Ganapathy, who is the uh, head of research and CEO of research in Unicus Research. He's going to be, co be coming us with us uh, soon. And before we start, we'll just give you a quick countdown. Ladies and gentlemen, may I have your attention, please? This is a global transmission. Hayek will be live in 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Enjoy the show. And we're back. Welcome. <laughs> so, Lovely Burke, let you. me... <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Lovely seeing you. Lovely seeing you guys, too. So, Burke, uh, I'm very curious. I'm seeing Silicon Valley Bank being mentioned everywhere in the news here in Brazil, and LinkedIn, social media. And what is happening? What is Silicon Bank, Valley Bank, and what is happening there? Uh, Silicon Bank, Silicon Valley Bank, <clears throat> was uh, one of the larger banks in the United States. <laughs> My apologies. <clears throat> you know, this is the beauty of the distributed network and working at home. There's always something going on. <clears throat> They're worried about the Silicon Valley Bank, too. Yeah. <clears throat> well, it, it's a dog now that's not barking. <laughs> but Silicon Valley Bank was a, a, um, a niche bank. It worked almost exclusively with high-tech companies and high-net-worth individuals. Um, it had, in the last couple of years, uh, an incredible <clears throat> growth in deposits and business it had uh, the holding company. They had a securities arm for selling stocks, and managing portfolios. They had custodial services for funds and hedge fund managers. Um, they had uh, a substantial back office uh, in helping their clients. They also were one of uh, several banks, <clears throat> now fewer, that aggressively entered the cryptocurrency sphere. You were able at Silicon Valley Bank to open up an account there in U.S. dollars and be able to convert your, your deposits into any one of a number of cryptocurrencies. They would take payments in crypt, from cryptocurrency uh, uh, clearing houses and they would make them. They were very aggressive. And, and so was Signature Bank and uh, Sterling Bank <clears throat> that... Uh, all three of these banks are now in receivership and are being wound up. And some of it, not all of it, but some of it has to do with the volatility of deposits that came with cryptocurrency. And <clears throat> just... It, 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 how do I say this nicely? Um, the fractional reserve banking system goes on the assumption that you'll have a great variety of types of depositors. Some will be in agriculture, some will be in retail, some could be in shipping, some in construction, some are mom and pops putting their money in the bank. <clears throat> so in that great diversity of deposit origins, uh, you're able to say, okay, at, at any point in time, we probably won't expect more than 10% of the money to be pulled out of the bank. And that's essentially where Silicon Valley Bank was. They were at about a, a 6 to 10% reserve. So that meant that if they had $100 billion out in uh, loans, deposits, investments, mortgages, they would only have to have $10 billion on hand in cash. Because as you look at any bank, you go into the bank, money's coming in, money's going out. <clears throat> and they, they come to a calculation that there's a, a, 
predictable amount of reserves that they'll probably need, hopefully never need. But um, if you exceed, if rather, if the demands exceed that reserve requirements, you now have what's called a run on the bank and the bank becomes insolvent. Doesn't mean the bank is broke. It means it doesn't have sufficient cash to pay the depositors. In the old days, it was called a run on the bank. Why was it a run on the bank? Because people would literally run down to the bank to physically withdraw their cash. When's the last time you went to a bank to physically withdraw cash? A really long time ago. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, unbelievable. I'm coming from the tech sector, and that's how this uh, whole issue and the headlines caught my attention. Because uh, as I'm working in tech industry, uh, I'm watching closely the main players and what's happening around them. So when all this panic raised up, it was mm -hmm. really noticeable. Uh, so what caught my eye? Like, okay, bank is having troubles. That's happening. People are panicking. That's normal. That's happening all around the world for like plenty of reasons. But what I don't <clears throat> understand, uh, what in the headlines and in the articles, they say that the bank failed to raise the capital. Question is why they need to raise the capital in the first place. That's the tech startup thing to raise the capital, not the banking system. You know, that's a great question. Let's start <clears throat> a little bit on the, the history of Silicon Valley Bank. Not too much of it. Let's go here to this one. And we'll share a screen. Come on. Come on. Let's begin with this. <clears throat> What you see here are the deposit growth in Silicon Valley Bank. That is an incredible gain in deposits. It's not just a little. You go from 192 billion in two years to 375 billion. That's an enormous rise in deposits. Where do you place all of that money? And here you have on balance sheet deposits. We'll look at the black for the moment. Just to be clear, bro, what does deposits mean so our viewers understand what's going on? <clears throat> Any money you put into a checking account, a savings account, or a CD is considered a deposit on balance sheet. So this is money owned by the, the clients of the banks, which the bank is withholding for them. All of this money is owned by the clients. Okay. All of it. <clears throat> that there are two categories, and we'll stick with on balance sheet. You go from 75 to 148, it's almost doubling. <clears throat> 75 to 148, it's almost doubling in a year. Mm -hmm. What was that from? <clears throat> well, it was from a couple of things. All the COVID loans that was going out to the companies from the federal government. A lot of this was from the COVID loans. Also, Silicon Valley Bank was a very aggressive underwriter of biomedical and tech startups. They would raise money for them and loan money to them. And here, even in 2022, they're up to $186 billion. They continued to grow. Now, the off-balance sheet client funds, these are things such as uh, you might find in a securities account, such as T-bills, T-notes, and other types of securities that <clears throat> the bank is, quote-unquote, not an inter intermediary or guaranteeing those fu funds. So, wow, what did they do with that money? Well, <clears throat> excuse my cough. Yeah. Um, you know, it's basic bank math. You know, banks take in deposits and use them to make loans. And the difference between the amount they pay on the deposit and the amount they charge for their loans is called a net interest margin. <clears throat> um, not rocket scientists. You know, in any business, <laughs> you, 
you try to make money on the money you have when you apply it to your company or sell your goods. In this case, their goods are money. So they borrow money at one or two percent. They lend it out at six or seven percent. That's their net interest margin. What Silicon Valley Bank did with their funds, all those rapid growth of funds, is they really <clears throat> they did mortgage loans and direct loans, mm -hmm. as well as buying treasury securities. They had eighty-two billion. Uh, in mortgage loans, almost 80% of that was residential. They had direct loans, $74 uh, billion. Uh, about half of it was short-term to venture capital and uh, the tech sector. <clears throat> and they had liquid assets of $55 billion. Mm -hmm. So the liabilities really fell into to two categories. Uh, deposits, $174 billion. And debt uh, and preferential um, investments, $25 billion. So <clears throat> what happened? To team inflation, the Fed raised interest rates. Now, how long have we known they were going to raise interest rates? I've known since last, <clears throat> since uh, January of last year. There's something called the Taylor model which tells you what the Fed rate needs to be to stop inflation. I calculated it in January of last year. I thought I was wrong. I shared it with another analyst, and we published an article in Unicus Research in, I believe it was March, the 1st of March of 2022, and the Taylor model said the Fed funds rate to stop inflation would have to be around 13%. Wow, that tells you inflation is roaring. So it, it, it's, it was not a secret. Um, so the Fed raised the interest rates. Okay. So you have um, a mortgage that's paying you back then probably 4%. Mm -hmm. what, what happens to the value of that mortgage when the interest rates keep going up, what happens to the, the value of that mortgage when interest rates goes up? It drops. Absolutely correct. But, <clears throat> excuse me, on the mortgages, excuse me. <coughs> on the mortgages, if they're held to maturity, meaning you're not going to sell those mortgages, you don't have to recognize that haircut on your assets, on your balance sheet. However, if you look at the footnote to their financials, they had an unrealized loss on those mortgages, a $15 billion unrealized loss. So <clears throat> you have um, <clears throat> you had a, a $12 billion equity cushion. A $15 billion unrecognized loss wipes out that cushion. Not covering. <clears throat> so what catalyzed the run? It's simple. Wednesday, last Wednesday, they sold $21 billion of liquid assets at a 9% loss <clears throat> to continue their liquidity. And they had expected greater losses than expected uh, because of their net interest margin lookout. They're, they're look for, looking forward on the net interest margin. Um, if, I, if, I can, uh, if I can interfere. Because sure. uh, like, what you're telling us, it makes sense. And if you're working in the financial sector, you're supposed to somehow know what's happening and what's going to happen. But it like, seems like no one saw it coming. Uh, I mean... I believe you did because you said it last year, January last year, that it's going to be like happening and you published the article. But why top management did not see it coming? Why? Because their management was crap. Let's put it straight out. Their management was crap. They did not have a chief risk officer for eight months. That position was unfilled. Mm. When a JP Morgan... <clears throat> Um, a manager asked them on the investor call 
that they have at the end of after the each reporting period. He said, I want to know, you know, can you explain this hundred and eighty two million dollar loss? You know, what is this loss from? from a write down in the value of your T bills and T bonds, but you don't even talk about, you don't even talk about the, um, the loss with the mortgages and the CEO did not answer the question. He went back to more or less talk about the environment in which they were working. Mm-hmm. And I'm, I'm, I'm going to get off on a tangent here, but S S <clears throat> Silicon Valley bank, SVB prided themselves on being DEI, diversity, equity, inclusion, okay. managed, as well as ESG managed. DEI is a disaster, <clears throat> an absolute disaster. I don't know if you've worked in an organization that espouses diversity, equity, and inclusion, but they are hiring people because of their form, not their function. For, yeah, form over function is always a failure. They're all pretenders. And ESG compliance is incredibly expensive to monitor and to <clears throat> to monitor to both monitor and to do it. Yeah. So we we have a problem uh, today where we confuse ESG with results. Right. ESG is something that's supposed to be nice to have if you can um, provide uh, value to the environment and social governance, etc. Um, but in the end of the day, the companies are there to give results and to make a profit. And that's the part that was neglected. There's no confusion there whatsoever. You're absolutely correct. <clears throat> it's an expense without a benefit for the shareholders. And Greg, I just wanted to come back now to uh, Daria's question. It's a distraction from keeping their eye on the balance sheet. Exactly. And that's a big problem we have with many companies nowadays. Mm -hmm. And coming coming back to Dash's question. Sure. um, The the bank, it's it's on the news that the bank failed to raise capital. Mm -hmm. Correct. And what is raising capital for a bank? Because um, usually we go to banks to raise capital for us, right? But what is, how does the bank raise capital? We, we are confused about that. D- don't think too much. They had a, a shortfall in the reserves. So they had to sell equity in the bank, sell shares in the bank to raise more money to increase the equity position, cash equity position in their bank. So That's people what they were pulling had to money do. away from the bank <clears throat> and they're like, okay, we're running out of cash. We need cash somehow. So they Correct. were trying to sell their own equity to raise more capital. Was that Not only that? were they selling assets and they took a hit on the assets, they were looking to raise more money by selling the equity in the bank. And they failed to do that. Yes. And when they failed to do that, and that was announced, that was the panic moment. Mm-hmm. And the run was not people running to the bank. The run was all electronic, <laughs> all little light transfers, speed. right? Speed of light. Um, you know, so Thursday after that announcement was made, depositors attempted to withdraw forty-two billion dollars. Sixteen billion succeeded leaving the bank with a negative $1 billion in cash. <clears throat> okay. Uh, we have a question here by <clears throat> Ahmed Kamel. Yes. Um, he's asking, isn't it planned by the bank to pay the bulks at a certain time so they planned it before? Uh, yes, but they failed. They failed. You have a large portfolio of fixed rate interest bearing products in your portfolio. Inflation is coming. They did not hedge the loss, the potential losses for the increase in interest rates. They failed to hedge. <clears throat> and that's, that's, that's a, a big problem. That comes back to your risk management. You know, where was the risk manager? This should be, 
your net interest margin, the uh, value of your securities, the environment of uh, uh, interest rate increases, that would have been what's called a klaxon horn. That should be a screaming bell in their ear about what needs to do to manage the risk. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, the feds came in on Friday and the feds had been, excuse me, the feds had been monitoring that bank as well as other banks that had volatile deposits. And SVB had very volatile deposits. What you, you take a look at the profile of their depositors, and only about 10% of their deposits would have been covered by the FDIC's $250,000 of insurance. Mm -hmm. Only about 10%. The other 90% had deposits well in excess of that. There's a lot they, of wealthy people investing there. A lot of wealthy people, a lot of tech companies. <clears throat> and one of the things that happened over the weekend, uh, Janet Yellen said, no, nope, we're not going to bail out the bank. And come Monday morning, Sunday or Monday, someone stepped in. I believe it was a president who made this uh, announcement, but I think it was a, a joint. They're not going to bail out the bank, but they're going to bail out the depositors. Mm -hmm. What does that mean? <clears throat> They're going to make the depositors whole. Why is that important? A lot of very substantial companies banked with Silicon Valley Bank, and it was their only bank. Why would they do that? Silicon Valley Bank helped raise the venture capital for them. <clears throat> Plus, they would typically ask for a line of credit with Silicon Valley Bank. Therefore, for Silicon Valley Bank's risk exposure, they would only do those two things if that client had Silicon Valley Bank as their sole bank. So they could monitor everything that was going on with that client. So now you have companies that has SVB as their sole bank. They don't have a hedge. They don't have any money anywhere else. And that's bad. <clears throat> it's the basic Real of bad. economy. <laughs> I mean, of your financial planning. How many how many companies, if they hadn't bailed out the bank, would have gone bankrupt within know, 30 days? I know several. <laughs> I mean, uh, that's why like, that's we uh, like put our ears on and like uh, started listening to what's happening there. Uh, but also several hundred would okay. have gone under. Yeah, several hundred would have gone under. But in the same time, uh, everyone hears about SVB and no one like talks as much about Silvergate and Signature Bank. But they somehow went down for the same reasons and uh, maybe like similar reasons. Uh, is it true or they have quite different situation? Um, <clears throat> Silvergate uh, went down because of the FTX failure. Silvergate was intimately involved with FTX, and when FTX went under, Silvergate just began the process of winding up. <clears throat> They're just shutting down operations, and it looks like everyone will get their money back from Silvergate. The shareholders will get nothing. Um, uh, Signature Bank is another bank that was closely tied to cryptocurrency as well, had a similar... Um, profile of customers like Silicon Valley Bank. Mm -hmm. Very wealthy <clears throat> without that diversity of population in their depositors. They had the very wealthy. And <clears throat> a comment from a, an attorney I've worked with for many years, David, uh, gosh, he's now going to kill me. David L'Esperance, he said, golden geese fly. If there's too much pressure, the golden geese fly. There's too many, too many taxes in one country, they'll leave. If there's a war in the country, the rich leave. And you could watch this happen very, very closely with Turkey when Erdogan started uh, 
cracking down on journalists. <clears throat> Most of the millionaires in Turkey left or moved their money out. And for six months, residents of Turkey were the number one applicant for citizenship by investment around the world. Golden geese fly. And that's what happened. They all tried to get out. <clears throat> and, you know, it's, it's just basic, simple math. <clears throat> you had a very Tony, very upscale bank that got a lot of money in. They invested that money in longer term assets, mortgages and loans. And then the value of those declined as interest rates went up. <clears throat> and they seem to be more interested in um, how they appeared as opposed to how they were, form over substance. And it was just terribly managed. You know, mm -hmm. I don't think there's any fraud here, but they're just terribly managed. So you don't think that like it's more of the banks will <clears throat> go down because for like for this for the reasons that we discussing here it's less likely or it depends case by case? Um, I expect some regional banks, <clears throat> small regional banks may have problems, but you have them all the time. Mm -hmm. Banks, ba banks fail. But <clears throat> when they get to a certain size, there should be more oversight. And they had the additional risk of the profile of their customers. And I think in the future, you're going to see some changes in banking regulations that will increase the amount of reserve capital required for those banks that deal primarily with very wealthy folks that can be a very volatile deposit base. <clears throat> I know in working with banks in the Caribbean, um, many of them kept margins in the neighborhood of... 15 to 20 percent is that a high margin or a low margin very high margin very high. yeah you'll, you'll see some of the major banks carrying margins of six to ten percent mm -hmm. and that's where uh, svb was i think uh, eight something eight to ten and by margin you mean the amount of money that they actually have compared to what the deposits <clears throat> of their clients are right what's okay. what's, what's called it's their capital, and there's, uh, without getting too, uh, too geeky, the Basel Capital <laughs> Accords breaks capital down into three tiers, tier one, tier two, and tier three. Tier one is cash and cash equivalents. Tier two are securities that can be reasonably be liquidated in a short period of time. Tier three are illiquid items, and there comes a haircut in value. <clears throat> so you may have... $100 in cash, that's tier one, that goes 100% towards capital. You may have $100 in uh, market securities. Mm, that's a 25% haircut. So now you have $175 in capital. And you have some buildings. It's a 50% haircut. So $100 in business, now you have $50. So now you have, you have $300, but you only have $225 in capital. Eric, we have two questions here from our viewers. I'm going to sure. share them here. I think they're they're similar in their you know, form. And I'm, I'm going to show them and I'm, I'm going to complement Please. after with, with what I can ask. So also is what happened to SVP, an alert for a bigger thing coming soon. For example, First Republic Bank and others. And then there's another question. This was from Ahmed Camo. There's another question from Juan Ayal. And he's asking, will this devaluate the American dollar? And I think what they're both getting at, something that I'm also curious, is that uh, we were wondering, you know, we, we saw in 2008 that it ca caught everybody by surprise in a black swan event. Nobody was looking at it, at least nobody that, you know, uh, from, from the general public. You were watching it probably, <laughs> very good. You were along with those folks in, the, what's the name of the movie, The Big Short, uh, yeah. that were, actually saw the thing coming. But, you know, it, it's, it's, it's those types of events that the general public are very surprised. And that's, that's my case. 
And uh, uh, we're wondering here, is, is, this, is, this, is there something more systemic going on? As in, we saw in 2008, there were a few, few banks like Lehman Brothers and a couple of few started breaking and then we had a huge recession. So is this like the tipping point of a new uh, systemic failure of banks and a recession or is this just a, an isolated case? Um, the answer is yes and no to both. I'll, I'll, I'll pick them apart bit by bit. First of all, First Republic is a very good bank. They've secured an additional $60 billion from JP Morgan to address issues, depositors' fears. <clears throat> But also understand, when you pull money out of bank A, where does it go? It's got to go to another bank. So it's, 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 it's a zero sum across the country in terms of deposits and movement of money. I think First Republic will be fine. <clears throat> But in the same time, they like interest rates raises. So the, the value of the, uh, like the value that many, that bank holds like drops down everywhere, right? Because right, but that can be thing. hedged. Mm -hmm. You can buy derivatives to hedge that. Right. And that's part of what a risk manager, if they had had one, would be doing. Um, <clears throat> Will it devalue the dollar? No. Actually, as the banks go up and down, uh, fail and succeed, it has very little to do with the value of the dollar. The dollar goes up and goes down based upon a delta between the interest rates offered on different currencies around the world. So if... <clears throat> So it actually be a symptom of the devaluation of the dollar, but inflation and then interest rate hikes. And this is a well, symptom. Well, as interest rates go up, more people will buy dollars because they can make more money on their, their – they'll convert from euros to dollars because they may only be able to get 1% to 2% in Europe. But if they can switch their euros to uh, dollars, you know, they right now could easily get 5%. <clears throat> So you sell euros, you buy the dollar, and you take a look at the value of the euro today, and you can see that's been happening for a while. And I believe recession is also here somehow. That's what we can see on the labor market and the tech market and like funding mm -hmm. everywhere. It's happening now. Yeah. And, and are we in for a recession? I don't know. I, I think we are. But I think it's not going to be a broad-based recession. It's going to be very a, a sectoral recession. Um, some cities in the United States have seen a 30% or more decline in the value of their homes. Here in my little town in Tempe, I've seen 4%. Why? Well, <clears throat> Arizona's growing. Arizona has a lot of high tech. We're the second per state in the United States. We're the state with the second largest chip manufacturing with the opening of four new plants that are being built, including two from uh, Taiwan Semiconductor, will be the number one semiconductor manufacturing location in the United States. I have a tremendous amount of aerospace out of here. <clears throat> Building plane engines, um, auxiliary power units, about 90% of all the APUs, the little engine you see in the back of the jet that runs to keep the electricity going, Uh, are built uh, in Phoenix. We build helicopters out in Mesa. I mean, so there's a lot of very high-tech manufacturing here. And why does it locate here? Well, got a tremendous school base between the three major schools. <clears throat> We have a lower tax rate and a better quality of living, and that's why all the Californians are moving here. Now, if they would only learn how to drive, it would be It would be helpful for me. <laughs> it's unlikely that we're going to see another 2008, but it's probably going to be more of a sectorized type of thing. Yeah. And, and what you're seeing is the unknown. And what happens when there are imponderables, people pull back, they go to cash, and they wait to see what's going to happen. And I think what you will see is I think you'll see a lot of curtailing of bank lending. More lending and investment is going to go to non-bank financial entities, such as private hedge funds, um, 
pension plans, and insurance companies. The banks have continually been disintermediated from lending from almost 80% of construction and home building loans, now down to about 30%. And quite frankly, it has to do with the regulation on the, the banks. <clears throat> In 2008, I went to my banker and I said, you know, hey, can I get a $100,000 line of credit to buy homes? He goes, no. <laughs> you know, um, we have to appraise each home and we do... I said, you don't understand. I'm buying them on the steps. They're foreclosures. I, the loan is that day. I have to pay on the steps. He goes, yeah, go see my friend Aaron. He gives me his card. I go to Aaron, and he's a portfolio manager for a large medical pension fund. Here's how the loan went. <clears throat> I'm not kidding. It was two-page agreement. We'll loan up to X dollars on any house you want to buy. You have to have 20% skin in the game, equity. Same day. So <clears throat> I said, you know, Aaron, I'm going to put my my 20% with you. So you write the whole check so you know everything I'm doing. He says, all right. I went down to the auction. I bought a town home for $15,000. I said, Aaron, I need a check for fifteen, dollars payable to the county. He goes, okay, come get it. <clears throat> he calls me back. Nah, I got a certified check. You're downtown. Let's go have a drink. Okay. So he comes. Gives the check. I have the title to the property. I sold the property the next day for twenty five. You know, that's that's the way I wanted to hold on to this property. Like not. <laughs> <coughs> and then I went and did it again. And I did that five or six times. Made a lot of money in two thousand and eight. Uh, and that was great. But you can't do that with traditional bank lending. So the banks will continue to be disintermediated. <coughs> Eric, we have another question here from our student, Jan Trulinski. Jan? If I spelled it correctly or not. But, but the question is, what do you think, Professor? Who are the biggest beneficiaries of the Silicon Valley Bank default? Uh, other banks and attorneys. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's... The lawsuit, a class action lawsuit, has already been filed by the shareholders against the officers and directors of the company. And what I find is kind of funny is that in most employment agreements, if an officer or director is sued, the bank, the company, will <clears throat> reimburse them 100% for litigation expenses. Uh-oh. Bank's not there. There's no reimbursement. <laughs> So about the only thing they'll be able to do is contact their errors and emissions uh, company <clears throat> and see what the E&O insurance may or may not do. Oh, one of the things, I, uh, um, a question that was asked um, of me this morning by my wife. <laughs> Laura asked, you know, how, how, how did this banker know to sell his shares a month or two before the, the meltdown? I said, well, he oh, did yeah. act. He didn't actually sell his shares, but he did. He had an option for shares as part of his compensation plan at, I think, $120 per share. The opportunity was to exercise that option at $120, sell the shares at, I think it was $280, and book a profit that day. His net shares from opening of the business day to the close of the business day, remained the same. <clears throat> he did not sell the shares he owned. He exercised his option to get the value out of the option. So do you think he saw it coming and that way he, that's why he sold it? Or did he just get, was it just coincidence? <clears throat> um, I think the answer is probably 50-50. Uh, as soon as... You know, I, I look at it this way. As soon as um, you know, I have a gentleman who invested in a company that went public and his share cost was 20 cents, <laughs> he had a million, a little over a million dollars in value of shares at 20 cents, so 5 million shares, and it came public at $8.00. I immediately advised his broker to short the stock at $8. And 
And my client's going, you think the stock's going to go down? I don't care whether it goes down or goes up. You now have 5 million shares you bought at 20 cents. You now have shorted 5 million shares at about $8. We've locked in a $7.80 profit. You have to hold those shares for 90 days before you can sell them. But whether the price goes up or down, you've profited $7.80. Okay, wow. The stock cratered. <laughs> It went down to a dollar <clears throat> in 90 days. His hedges were incredibly profitable. He lifted the hedges, took the profit on the hedges, and he still owns the shares. Not a bad move. Yeah, but, you know, it, it, same thing. The stock could have gone up to $10 a share, and he would have lost on the hedges. Then he delivers his stock against the sale, and... He, uh, he still would have had $7.80 profit. So how will the companies get their money back? Very simple. They go to Silicon Valley Bank and ask for it. The feds are backing it and putting the money in necessary to make it happen. So the, will they get their money back, the, the people, uh, the, the depositors? Or? The depositors will be made whole. The shareholders get nothing. Okay. <clears throat> the shareholders make nothing because the bank failed. I, I get that. Uh, but the, but I think the, the more sensitive point is the people who had their monies in the bank, right? The depositors. Those people are going to get their money back. Yes. I think it was a wise choice. I don't like the moral hazard of bailing out a bank, but this this, this was not bailing out a bank. This was bailing out depositors. Many companies had no choice but to bank with Silicon Valley Bank. So this <clears throat> is the government bailing out the depositors. Correct. The, the money is going to come from the federal government. Right. And, and I think as the, the federal government goes in and takes a look at the holding company for Silicon Valley Bank, and as they sell off those different entities that I think the, the, the government's not going to lose a dime. I mean, they're ensuring the economy going because if, uh, if those companies will lose money, that will be the domino effect everywhere. You're absolutely cor correct. And you can, you can envision it um, a little like what happened when FTX failed. It caused a failure cascade. Many other crypto companies failed because they were overcommitted to FTX. They had their money with them. Hedge funds collapsed. Currencies collapsed. Um, businesses collapsed. And it continued. And as each one of those items collapsed, there was a couple of others behind them, each one a little bit smaller. But still, it's a, it's, it's a collapse because of a concentration of risk in FTX. And if FTX... Uh, depositors only got 250000 and some of them had a billion dollars in deposit with them, what happens to that company? Just close the door, send everyone home. <clears throat> it's over. And that, that would ripple through the economy. Uh, th that would be terrible. And what's the, what's the lookout now for the, the startup sector work is it, is it a good time for people to start a new business is it a time for us to wait a little bit until things get better what what is your opinion does it, does it change anything no you know if if you have a good startup idea and you've tested your idea again and again and again you'll be able to raise the capital What I think we're going to see the end of is the dumb money out there, the special purpose vehicles. I think those are great shorts. 85% of those companies lost money. The share value just crashed after a month or so. That was something at Unicus Research we did was look at all. Uh, is that me? No. Okay. 
was look at all uh, special purpose acquisition companies and what they were acquiring and the values they were paying. And what you would see is the day of the merger, there'd be an incredible spike upwards, followed by a crater. So we did uh, very well for our uh, clients by advising them to short many SPAC mergers. <laughs> so I think the dumb money is good, but real money is always there to invest in a good idea. Um, I'm involved in a project that's <clears throat> part over there and part down there. Um, and we've gone out and we've raised uh, a chunk of money to get the company started. And it was, it was harder, harder than normal, but we got it. Took three months, but we got it. <clears throat> I just want to uh, go back a bit. You were mentioning that it will influence this like whole situation and influence regional banks somehow. So um, my colleague Herman is uh, asking the question, uh, what would be happening with SVB UK and what would be the impact here? Because that's another branch, regional, that does not have anything to do with like, like SVB headquarters, but... Well, actually, it, 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 it had a lot to do with SVB. It was a very profit. It is a very profitable operation in the UK, but by law, <clears throat> it was firewalled from SVB US. So the entity in the United Kingdom is a standalone entity, and that's one of the entities that will be sold off um, to other companies. What does being firewalled mean? <clears throat> Um, liabilities from SVB US will not flow through to SVB UK. It's just a way to make sure that um, the regulators in the UK know exactly what's going on and don't have to worry about contagion risk from another country. It's a common requirement in uh, international banking that each bank in each different country is often firewalled from their uh, counterparties in other countries. <clears throat> in this case, uh, what's going to be happening with depositors of uh, SVB UK? I mean, nothing. nothing. Feds, like, will they, nothing? They will be just like the bank will be sold to other people, like the other company or other people, and like uh, the processes will go on, right? Correct. Okay. That's nice. Um, <laughs> <laughs> like, I mean, insuring somehow. <laughs> uh, uh, I just want to be uh, to go a bit into uh, let's say theory and uh, for people to understand the general procedures here. So uh, Wikipedia was the first to update that the SVB was a bank, but uh, it took way longer uh, procedure to actually for bank to be closed, right? And some procedures has to be run and like what how it's happening usually. Um, a um... A government takeover of a bank is brutal and quick. Mm -hmm. They come in on a Friday and lock everything down, secure all the records, have the necessary capital behind them. <clears throat> By Monday morning, uh, the employees know whether they have a job or not. Management is gone. Retail, uh, about half of the retail um, folks gone. The analysts in the back office were told they have 40 days at this point in time. But all they're doing, <clears throat> it's, they're, uh, they're getting all the depositors paid off. So as each depositor is paid off, that's one less customer. And once that is done, what is left but to sell off the assets? And who is taking their care of the credits uh, that the bank was giving away? <clears throat> who is receiving the, like, so credit, like people who took the credit that they don't need to pay it off or? Oh, yes, they do. <laughs> so I. Uh... <clears throat> oh, yes, they do. <clears throat> and that's an asset of the bank. I've loaned, uh, I'm Bank of Burke has loaned Edson a million dollars and Bank of Burke fails. Edson goes, wow, I don't have to pay it back. Wrong. The FDIC will take that 
asset and sell it to another bank or another creditor that will come after Edson. It doesn't go away. I just yeah. owe money no to, luck, the Edson. to the different organization. <laughs> <laughs> no, but there, uh, I have a, a couple of folks I've worked with that worked with the Office of the Comptroller of the Currency and the Federal Reserve System <clears throat> and the FIC. They have a playbook when they go into a bank. And when you think of a shock troop, that's what they are. A shock troop with briefcases and laptops. They are very good at what they do. Very good. <clears throat> and it's essentially quick assessment of the assets, the liabilities, if we're taking care of all the depositors, we know what's in their accounts. Mm -hmm. So each one of the depositors will have one transaction, your money out. So if you have 5,000 customers, you only have 5,000 transactions to process. Then you have the assets of the bank. What are your mortgages? What are your credit lines? What are your office buildings, land, etc., your subsidiaries, those get sold off. It's, it's, it's kind of like a, a slaughterhouse for a bank. They come in, <clears throat> gut it, done. Sell off the bits and it's over. I'm Scary. glad... Yeah, it's scary, but I'm glad the process is uh, so well done. So there is no questions that like can come up on the way, and no mm -hmm. uh, no space for the mistake. No room. There's already a procedure in place. Yeah. Mm -hmm. If you take a look for the future, if you want to monitor banks and become a bank weenie, look and always calculate the net interest margin. Now, admittedly, you only get that about a month after a quarter is over. Also monitor with Edgar, if they're a public company, what are called the um, 8Ks. Those are incidents of relevance that may not be yet reportable on a quarterly financial statement, such as the sale of assets, the changing of management. <clears throat> so wait, what was the two indicators? Net interest rate? Net interest margin. The Net margin interest between margin? deposits and loans, correct. <clears throat> okay, and what's the other one? The other one are monitoring 8Ks through some of uh, Edgar. Um, what is Edgar? Edgar, just edgar.com. You can, all the public records for public companies go there. And they're filed electronically. And we um, monitored 8Ks? 8Ks. Those what are 8Ks? 8K is a report for something material that has occurred that needs to be reported quickly. You can't wait till a quarterly financial or an annual financial. Okay. And that's um, probably an American regulation of some file that they have to. That's absolutely correct. Comply. Okay. It's, it's a regulation of the Securities and Exchange Commission to, to be filing these. Okay. So for the international crowd, they'll probably <clears throat> look at something similar in their worst <clears throat> countries. Uh, correct. And um, I would add to take a look at the. Uh, you know, the amount of deposits uh, divided by the number of depositors. And when you see such a high concentration of high net worth individuals and high net worth companies, you have an additional risk uh, called flight risk. They're, they become much more volatile deposits. Yet, and, and we saw this uh, back you know, before 2008, a lot of the banks were brokering certificates of deposit. They were, you know, I can get I can get 5.5 here. No, but I can get 5.8 over there. So you'd have a $10 million 5.5, but you'd move it over to a 5.8 in a heartbeat. Those the deposits, uh, big CDs became a very volatile deposit. And if you were brokering or supporting uh, those looking for large CDs, jumbo CDs, the Federal Reserve upped your reserve requirements. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> because if you have a CD that's only a year and you've got a $10 million CD, what are you doing with that $10 million? 
how do you make enough money? What's your net interest margin on that to be profitable? It's not long-term mortgages. <laughs> it's not long-term mortgages. And the uh, last item is uh, the mix of maturities. What are the maturities? A mature maturities of their investments versus deposits. And banks always have the problem that they borrow short term but lend long term. Mm -hmm. And that is very difficult in a market where interest rates are rising. And how do we see that from where? Because uh, I'm, it's the first time for me to hear this uh, aspect of uh, banking system. So I'm not sure where to find it. You'll find a lot of this in their financials. Let me pop up here, Edgar. So just a thought here. <clears throat> now, uh, in Brazil, interest rates mm -hmm. are wildly changing all the time. <clears throat> we have, a, yeah, we have a, a crazy type of system here. Like in, in one year, it's five uh, percent; the other year, it's fifteen percent, and goes back to five. And it, it's 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 all over the place. But in US, you have we had a very stable interest rate environment for a long time since 2008 until now like it's, it's very low for a long time and now that you have a little spike uh it seems like turmoil is already happening um well here in brazil like banks are probably used to this madness right? so, would you say it's it's it's, it's the it, the stability is is um kind of a two-edged sword here in, in the u.s yes it is i agree because with the stability, you get complacent about risk. Oh, it'll never happen. The Fed, you know, going, but you have to take a look, going from 0.8% interest just to, to 1.6, you've doubled the interest rate. And 0.16, you go to uh, 3.2, you've doubled the interest rate again. Mm -hmm. You know, it's only a 1% increase. Yeah, but if you're already at 1%, one, another 1% on top of that, you've doubled it. <clears throat> Very significant. Why don't you pop up the share screen for a second? Yes. <clears throat> and there's Edgar. This is the uh, from the SEC. And let's do this real quick here. Let's see. What's that? Edgar.com? Yeah, uh, sec.gov slash Edgar. Okay, if you Google Edgar, you probably find that. Edgar Absolutely. <clears throat> so I can... Use for information Edgar. for everyone who wants to research. Uh, yeah. I'm trying to remember the symbol. There we go. You put the t is that a ticker of the stocks? That's absolutely correct. Okay. And here you have... 8Ks, important filings. Ah, okay. That's the 8 Those are the important filings, right. Bankruptcy or receivership. <laughs> uh, prospectus, that's what they took out to potentially raise capital. And every public company <laughs> in the U.S. is listed there. Correct. As their files there. Okay. Or a statement. You have a 13 statement of acquisition. See what happened here. Name of reporting persons, SVB Financial Group. Shares sold, 783,000. <clears> so you're seeing a lot, a lot of people right here beginning the sale of stock. Third, the ninth, the tenth. The annual report. Let's see. Let's go. Here. Let's do this by date. <clears throat> and then here we have an AK. Uh, let's see other events. And this is what an AK looks like. Okay. March tenth, SPB Financial Group, wholly owned subsidiary of Silicon Valley Bank was closed by the California Department of Financial Protection and Innovation and the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation was appointed a receiver. The company is no longer a parent company of the bank. 
Great. So now we know net interest margin and Edgar, look at the eight Ks. Yeah. And if you want to, for the financials, you'll find those as 10 Ks and 10 Qs. 10 K is an annual report. 10 Q is a quarterly report. Awesome. <clears throat> All right. <clears throat> I have just, here. Go ahead, Dasha. Yeah, what? if I may, I just have one last question, maybe uh, just to wrap up. So, um, tech industry tends to accumulate in places, right? Together in one place, everyone likes the same bank, the same valley, the same, like, I don't know, investors or like uh, anywhere. Anyway, uh, so uh, what me as a tech startup shall pay attention to? Uh, to avoid like within the banking system uh to avoid losing money i mean to avoid repeating the situation let's say great uh, question um yes different types of industries cluster and uh old coast was pretty good at explaining why and in, in his uh on the firm <clears throat> You have a lot of people that have a skill set in a particular area. They're drawn together because you need each other. And then you have that common DNA problem in the community that you all are doing something very similar and are looking for similar type of financing. That's a good thing. How do you avoid losing your money in a bank? There are two real things you can do as a tech startup. One, you can choose to buy additional deposit insurance from the private insurance market. You can buy additional deposit insurance from the private insurance market. <clears throat> That's a choice. The other thing I would do, which is better, <laughs> is I would take your money out of your checking account or your savings account and buy treasuries. In the United States, U.S. treasuries, buy treasuries direct. And that way, it's not the bank's money. And every time a T-bill matures, you can buy 30, 60, 90 days. You can keep rolling them over, or you can deposit the money into your account to use. So instead of buying it through the bank, you buy it straight from the U.S. Treasury. Yeah, or the bank could have a, um, a brokerage side. You move your money over to the brokerage and buy the treasuries there. Mm -hmm. that's, that's capital, not on the balance sheet. <clears throat> so I, I would, you know, that's what I advise my clients to do if they have a substantial amount of money is just buy treasuries direct. If you're going to sit on a million dollars, why let the bank pay you less than the treasury rate? Mm -hmm. And there's no commission. <clears throat> here, hold on a second here. Correct. It would come right up. There we go. <clears throat> Let's share screen again. There. So, Where's what are you showing us, Berg? It's where you buy Treasury Direct. Ah, yeah. yes. Perfect. Mm -hmm. And everything from savings bonds to T-bills, T-bonds, and T-notes. Useful tip for all the startups out there. Yeah. Or even the established invest? companies. Established companies is by the right. <clears throat> mm -hmm. Great. So just so, to close out. Um, sure. Go ahead. No, just I'm going to do the same thing you're, you're, you're about to say is closing out Silicon yeah. Valley Bank. Um, was a smart bank with really bad management, really bad. No risk chief risk officer for eight months. They're spending more time on ESG and DEI than they are paying attention to the business. ESG mm -hmm. is an expense that a wealthy company might want to do, but it's not required in the United States. I had a <clears throat> colleague of mine who was the CFO of the company I was working in. He, he, he used to categorize things as nice to have 
and must have. So the ESG is one of those categories that is nice to have. And must haves are your liquidity, your financials, and your profitability, right, Rick? Absolutely correct. It's it's the old thing. Uh, must have a working car. Nice to have a Bentley. <laughs> <laughs> But uh, so, so SVB Bank uh, was poorly managed. They had a very volatile deposit base. The deposit base moved. And uh, the three banks we discussed, Silvergate, Signature, and SVB, all had that same risk of volatile uh, deposits. And <clears throat> I don't see that there's any contagion. Uh, the money hasn't disappeared. It's going someplace else. Uh, and bailing out the depositors, I think, was a good idea by the government. I am thankful they did not bail out the bank. <clears throat> Let the bank and the shareholder suffer. Great. As a libertarian, I would even uh, say don't bail out the, the depositors, but that's a <laughs> long discussion and we can have yeah. another day. I, just, I look at the cascade of failures. The damage done, uh, since the Fed will end up a, a probably net even or maybe even a little bit of profit, there's no reason to cause that damage. But if I have to admit that if I was a depositor with a couple million dollars there, I would certainly be uh, lobbying the bank, <laughs> the government to pay me. A couple of million dollars. <laughs> I'm 100 ordered. I want my money anyways. <laughs> <laughs> or whatever money I have. Yeah. All right, guys. This has been a delight. Daria, good to see you again. Lovely. Lovely seeing you as well. Thank you. Thank Ms. you so Benson. much. Thank see you that? so much, Bert. You got it. And Be safe. Thank you for all the viewers who watched us, and I hope you see us next time. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye.